Hey everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. One year ago today, March 20th, 2020, I did my first episode of Chef AJ Live. At the time, I didn't really know it was going to be a show. It was just an effort to connect with people during this, the beginning of the pandemic. I had no idea that people would come on and so many people would watch on a daily basis. And I'm just so honored that now we are in season two with our first episode. It's actually episode 445. I've interviewed over 500 guests for the show. And I decided to start the new season with the guest that had the most views of all the guests. And it is none other than multiple New York Times bestselling author, nutritional guru, everyone's favorite doctor on the subject, Dr. Dr. Joel Furman. Thank you so much for taking this spot. My pleasure. Looking forward to it as yeah. usual. Yeah, I, Dr. Furman, before we begin, I just want to tell you how much I really truly appreciate what you do because somebody of your stature often wouldn't give somebody like me the time of day. You've been on the show three times and with the summits, I've done three Truth About Weight Loss summits and a GI Health summit and you are one of only two. We, we've interviewed over 150 doctors now. You're only one of two that has actually been on every single summit. You're always one of the most popular guests and your information is amazing. And I, what I really appreciate about you is that you're not afraid to tell the truth. There's so many people that are doctors or in the nutritional space, even in the plant-based world that are like, oh, you know, oil's okay. You know, little vegan junk food's okay. A cheat day's okay. And you really tell the truth. You're not afraid to speak up, up for, for the health of people. You're really one of the only ones in the plant-based world that gets food addiction. So, so thank you for that. My pleasure. Yeah. And I and think that, you know, that um, I am, some people may consider my viewpoints radical, but I want to give people the best information so they could choose to do um, what part of it or all of it. I always felt like that if you'll sell a person out, if you water down the information, to try to expand your reach to make it more palatable to more people, then you sell out those people who want the best information so they could have gotten well or the best results. So by trying to make it more politically, more applicable, more that people want to hear, you just weaken the message and don't, and, and you have to um, you know, deviate from optimal, you're deviating from the truth of what's best for people to do. And, you know, you, and you're not afraid to tell parents that they're not doing right by their children when they feed them this junk food, that it's really not okay. Right. And I'm not afraid to tell people that if they're a little bit overweight, they're still putting themselves at health risk, that there's no such thing as a healthy overweight person. And we have all these healthy eating plant-based eaters or vegans. They, they're healthy. They think they're healthy, but their body fats are 30%. They weigh 140, 150 pounds, and they think they're healthy, and they're, and they're not because fat cells spew out reactive oxygen species, cytokine, lipokines, increase insulin resistance, increase estrogen production, increase angiogenesis. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that the foundational principle behind my Nutritarian approach is, that, is this idea of moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence, and that we have to modulate the quality of what we eat and the quantity of what we eat to make sure that we achieve an optimal body weight. And that means that a, that a, woman's, be, a, a woman's body fat percent to be healthy has to be below 25% and a male's has to be below 15%. And it, it's, you're, you're, tr trick, um, you're, you're not being honest with yourself and people don't have the perception because they think because they're eating healthy, it's okay that they still remain overweight because everybody in America is overweight and they just look like everybody else, but it's still not ideal. Yeah, well, your height weight chart, is that the gold standard? Because I'm, I'm even overweight according to yours by about five pounds. I don't have one specific weight chart or one specific amount of what I tell people to weigh. I, I do... Um, you know, I do tell people for most, for males, ideally their BMI should be below 22 and females should be below 21, a BMI. But there are some individuals that could have, you know, bigger bone structures that could always, there's always the exception. But regardless of your BMI, whether it's above 22 for a male and above 21 for a female by a touch, you still, body fat still should be below 25% for a female and below 15% for a male. I'm 67 and my body fat's about 10, 10%. There's no reason why a male's body fat should be above, above 15%. Ideally for a woman, it might even be below 23%, but, but certainly 25% is reasonable to expect people to have their body fat below that. 
So I think that that's the, it's a, it's a high expectation for some, but it's something we should be achieving tor towards. And if you have to do exercise to achieve that, in addition to eating right, then that's great. Wow. Well, thank you. I just want to show you something. My birthday is in two days and look what somebody gave me. Oh, wow. That stuff is super expensive. I know, you know that is a good friend. Somebody that buys you Dr. Furman's vanilla powder. Thank you so much, Laurel. Oh Pena. my goodness. You know how expensive that is? It's That's almost like, $100. It's almost like $200 a pound. Yeah, it's, it's like tremendously expensive stuff. It's so good though. It is the greatest stuff because it's, it's good for you. It makes things taste great. And you don't use that much. So it's really worth it, you know? Well, I, it sells, I, I agree. We had you. to buy it because it was more expensive everywhere else. So we had to get it and put it up there because people were packed, couldn't find it for less than like $300 a pound. So we had to get some and get them to be, even though it's super expensive, it's still the best price you can get it at. You know what I mean? No, and I agree with you as a chef, it's unparalleled. I won't even use extract anymore. It's just, there's yeah, some- Yeah, me neither. The extract, the fake vanilla stuff, it's in the liquids. This is really real ground vanilla bean, you know? Exactly, because the alcohol-free has glycerin, which is sugar, and the one that's not alcohol-free has sugar. It just doesn't taste good. I'd rather omit the vanilla than not use vanilla powder. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So so we call today's uh, getting together metabolism, body fat, oils, aging, and weight loss. Which one of those would you like to talk about first? I, I wouldn't mind if you talked about oils because there is now a, a slew of younger vegan doctors that are basically saying it's not only okay, but that it doesn't impact somebody's heart disease. And with the um, percentage of people overweight and obese, I just don't understand how anybody is recommending oil as, as a food. Well, you know, I'm, I'm saying something a little even more radical in the other direction. I'm saying as, as crazy as this sounds, I'm actually saying olive oil and these oils actually increase the risk of cancer like breast cancer. So I'm saying completely opposite what these people are saying. The reason I'm saying that, and I think I can justify that with science, is because oil is so effective at preventing weight loss and maintaining people in the overweight condition. And it's being chronically overweight that, set, that raises um, aromatase activity and raises your estrogen levels that increase risk of breast and prostate cancer. And it's being chronically overweight that keeps you chronically insulin resistance, insulin resistant. And then you have a higher glucose response with more advanced glycation end products circulating, which age you faster. So I'm making the connection between oil and body fat because we know when people either remove less than the oil or switch oil, the same amount of calories of oil into nuts and seeds, they lose weight. And that's well established in the scientific literature. So there's no sign. So I'm saying something even further here that if you were going to a buffet and I gave you a tablespoon of olive oil, 120 calories of oil to eat on the way to the buffet, because there's no fiber and no volume and no significant nutrient load, and it's absorbed so rapidly into the bloodstream. When you got to the buffet, you wouldn't eat 120 calories less, you eat the same amount of calories. It has no effect to ratchet down the apostat. So the additional oil you eat is just additional calories you could, would have consumed that you're consuming that you wouldn't have consumed if you didn't put the oil on. It has no effect to reduce your appetite. If I mix the oil and the food on the buffet, then the scientists measuring how much people ate would find out they ate more than 120 calories extra from the oil. They ate 200 calories extra because oil is an appetite stimulant makes you want to eat more food of whatever it is you're eating. Furthermore, because the oil, it goes into the calories from the oil go into the bloodstream so rapidly, it stimulates dopamine receptors in the brain the same way as other addictive substances like sugar does. It's the speed at which calories enter the bloodstream. Medical, the medical term for that is called a bolus. The word bolus means it all enters at once. It doesn't come in slowly. When you eat calories from a walnut or pistachio nut, you get one or two calories a minute coming in. Here you get 30 to 40 calories a minute coming in. And you know, when your body takes in fat calories slowly, your body preferentially burns those fat calories for energy. It burns it off and it'll burn off the omega-6 calories as they're coming in to keep your omega-3, omega-6 ratio favorable. When you take in oil calories, there's no burning off. It has to go to storage. When it goes to storage, it turns on fat storage hormones, which stay elevated for days. And, and you continue to eat oil every few days and you have your fat storage hormones activated and people wondering why they're not weigh 145 pounds and they're not losing weight for a five foot four woman or something. Why she's not losing weight and she's cutting back on their food, but she's still putting oil in the food. And what I'm saying right now is 
oil has not only makes for excess calories, but it has biological effects to retard your body's efforts to get rid of excess fat on the body. And I'm making this clear in this conversation, how dangerous I think excess fat on the body is. I've already gave you three or four examples and that the hormones that lead to fat storage and, and like insulin also activate angiogenesis promoters because fat cells in general are, are blood vessel hypoxic tissue. They don't have a great blood supply because they don't get a great blood supply in order to grow, they have to release certain mediators and, and hormones that tells new blood vessels to grow into them. The word angiogenesis means the promotion of the growth of new blood vessels. So fat cells can grow more, right? So you, now cancer cells need angiogenesis promotion so they can replicate, grow and metastasize. Without angiogenesis promotion, you can't get cancers to spread. Fat cells on the body are almost necessary to allow cancers to replicate and spread. So I'm saying it's irrelevant whether a little bit of oil raises your cholesterol or is cardiovascularly negative or positive compared to a person eating butter, meat, pasta, or a white potato, it's irrelevant. What's relevant is the oil is the most body fat promoting. It prevents, and most people are, as you just said earlier, most people in America are overweight. If you were working eight hours a day behind a plow, you know, in an ox, you know, when you were a professional athlete and you could handle a little oil in your diet and still keep your body fat low and be really slim, probably be great for you. But most people don't, aren't professional athletes or working physical jobs. And most people, unfortunately, are significantly overweight. And that little bit of oil sabotages their ability to get healthy. You know, I couldn't agree more. And, the, and it's generally the doctors that are telling people it's okay are ones that have never been overweight, you know? Right, they've never been overweight, yeah. And they don't know how, how some people have very slow metabolic rates and a little bit of deviation from what would be what we're considering ideal could, could sabotage their results. I take care of, as you know, I have people here who are diabetic with high blood pressure who are overweight. And it's not that easy to get them well if they don't keep dropping weight every single week. Why we're monitoring them so they know exactly how to eat. So when they go home, they can replicate exactly what we taught them to do because they know they're losing two to three pounds a week and they can keep it going at home. They know exactly what to eat, exactly how much to eat. They've adjusted it so they get results so they can replicate it. The ultimate um, decisions here, if you're not getting results, you're doing something wrong. You have to get results if you're overweight so you achieve an ideal weight. Right. I say a nutritarian is somebody at their ideal weight, or if they're overweight, they're moving towards that ideal weight at, at least two pounds a week. If they're not dropping two pounds a week in the direction of their ideal weight, then they're not following, you know, my recommendations because you have, because that's because moderate caloric restriction is part of it and eating less food um, slows the aging process and even has the ability as we see it and measure it to reverse aging. I know that sounds crazy and radical, but we measure these aging parameters and we're seeing people age backwards. Now I'm not saying you're gonna, um, I'm saying what they've accelerated their aging and they've gotten to themselves in bad health and their aging parameters are abnormal like their telomeres and their stem cell measurements and their inflammatory markers show they're at a higher chronological age, biological age than their chronological age. But then we get them doing the right thing and naturally we see the biological age measured by telomeres improving. So it's, we're seeing people actually get healthy, reverse disease and age backwards. Well, I, we know this works, but people still say that the diet that you and I eat and recommend without sugar, oil and salt, it's extreme. I mean, how do you eat at restaurants? How do you eat at other people's houses? You know, and, and this idea, you know, of these cheat days, the people that you and I know and work with, they can't afford a cheat day. Right. You know, I always give the story of like, yeah, one, I won't give the whole story now, but one cheat meal sets a person back for three days. Now that one cheat meal, because when you are losing weight, you're not just burning calories. Your body is also removing toxins and acidity and your body holds on to fluid and swells itself. So when you are getting healthy, you're spewing out toxins and you're spewing out extra fluid that the toxins needed to dilute them so they wouldn't irritate tissue as much. So when you go off your diet, your body stops removing toxins, it stops removing fat, and it stops getting, and you hold on to fluid too, which is also reflective of, of um, improper health, to have excess fluid being held by the body. Yeah, absolutely. 
So if you don't mind, I, there are some questions that have been sent in because you're very popular and I'll, I'll start with a few of them. We have one from Deborah. I recently started eating a whole food plant-based diet June, 2020 due to having Crohn's disease. I just had a colonoscopy and they found deep ulcers in my intestine, which can turn into fistulas. Is there any possibility of healing naturally from this? My doctor wants me to take medication for the rest of my life, which I don't want to do. And I don't want another surgery. Yeah, over the, uh, you can imagine over the last 30 years, my a lot of my work has been involved with taking care of people with autoimmune conditions, especially colitis and Crohn's disease. Um, so it's very, um, you know, so it's just um, very, very, very critical that this person knows they can get well and that we have certain protocols they have to follow. But if they're having inflammation there, then they have to be on a diet of pretty much mostly cooked foods and, and they have to have, and we usually give them um, some extra elements like high dose probiotics and high omega th or EPA fish oils. You know, high, we give them in, um, a lot of inflammatory, anti-inflammatory type materials. And we usually heat, give them juices that have been mildly heated as well. So we have a protocol to get the inflammation down. And then we, as they're doing better, we can wean them off the primarily cooked food and heated diet. We can go towards a more um, you know, more raw foods that are blended. So it has to be done in stages. And it's really just hard in this type of a conference to tell a person what to do. They need particular guidance based on their individual um, disease process, which in, even involves blood tests to make sure we're doing, we're, you know, adjusting the, the, um, the food and the supplements accordingly to help them heal. So that's something I do do. And I um, actually have had, had people come to the retreat here to get well from that. One example is a um, a 19 year old boy who, well, he, I think he was like 16 when he came here, but at 16, when he came here, he had an active Crohn's disease on Remicade. And he stayed here for a couple of months and I've been in contact with him over the last year since he's been gone. And he pretty much has made a complete recovery from his Crohn's disease. So we have a lot of, that's just one example, but I have, over my career, I've had to treat a lot of people with colitis and Crohn's. I remember years ago, I had one person who, I, who lived in my house for like two months who came out of the hospital. They wanted to remove his colon wanted to surgically remove his colon and he was on steroids and he wasn't on eating anything. So I told him, well, get, you know, we'll come into go right from the hospital and come in and live with me for a while. He lived in my house for a while in the bedroom before my, before Kara was born, he was up in that bedroom. But anyway, he stayed in the, in that room. We, we, um, I kept, I fasted him for a period of time. I think I fasted him for about 10 days once he wasn't eating in the hospital, but he was off the steroids now fasting in my house. And then I put him on just steamed zucchini and cooked vegetable juices for about two to three weeks after that. He was only on pureed steamed zucchinis that we steamed with the full skin on and veg and cooked. And then so that and then we gradually fed him on to some like red new skin pota potatoes, new skin potatoes without the skins on them with the zucchini. We gradually advanced his diet and he for and he of course made a recovery too. But it was a very um, harrowing. And you know, he was in a very dangerous position with having like 18 bloody bowel movements a day and they wanted to take his colon out. So I have some, taken care of some very, very severe cases and achieved um, results in those cases. And so now it's almost like people can live with you again at the Eat to Live retreat. You know, I always love that, that people, you know, my wife and I, first of all, enjoy getting to know people and having, you know, it's because I always, we always talk about people years ago um, when we first got married and I was first a doctor I used to have people living in my basement, you know, on beds in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, but, but now we have a beautiful place where people come on, but it's nice to know people and get to know them. And, not, and it helps the healing when you, as you know, you can't just come in for a doctor visit sometimes and, and get a person to really understand everything they have to do and they need help to do it. And of course, we're dealing with a lot of people who still have addictive relationships, dip, this addictive love affair with food and that, that period of abstinence where they learn to make healthy food taste great is the, it, you know, turns it around for them too. Thank you. Uh, Sherry wants to know if we can freeze the Dr. Furman vanilla powder. It's available on your website, drfurman.com in the store. I think that's probably a good idea. It might keep for a year out of the refrigerator, but if you know, because it's expensive and you, you lose it, you don't know how long you're going to use it for. It might be a good idea to take some out into a smaller bag or a glass and then keep that in your refrigerator and the other part you could freeze. It's a good idea. Yeah, that's what I've always done. I just want to let you know. Thank you, Randy Dolan. You got us a super chat donation. So thanks, Dr. Furman. And here's a question from Nataria. 
Regarding white blood cell count, I recently saw a YouTube video of Dr. Furman saying that people who follow a nutritarian diet have a lower white blood cell count. I did some blood tests recently and my white cells were lower. Should I be worried? You should be proud of yourself for a, for a health accomplishment because we know in the scientific literature that lower white blood cell counts are, leaded, are linked to reduced inflammation, longer lifespan, and lower risk of cancer. So this is a very good question because people should be aware that the normal range of white blood cell counts is abnormally high because it's measured because they set the normal based on where most Americans run. And you go to your doctor and he sees your white blood cell count is 3.2 or 2.8 or 3.8. And in the normal range is five to 10. And the doctor says, oh my goodness, you're something wrong with you. Your white blood cells are too low. You need to get a bone marrow biopsy. You could have cancer. And I'm saying to people, no, it's the doctor that needs the bone marrow biopsy for his high white blood cell count. You have the normal white blood cell count because you're eating right. And we know that these cells, like the battery in the flashlight, maintains its charge when the battery is turned off. Our white blood cell counts are lower because our white blood cells are safely tucked away. You could say they're, um, they're, they're safely in, their, in the bone marrow, not being utilized, not much inflammation. So then should we get a pneumonia or should some, some infection or some serious issue? Now we have white blood cells that can function more effectively when we need them to function. Because people are constantly inflamed, keeping the white blood cells activated all the time. They're not gonna respond well when they get sick or they're exposed to a virus or, an, or, a bac or a bacterial illness. So we have better white blood cell activity and this woman should be proud of herself and be able to stand strong against her physician and saying, no, my white blood cell counts are good. It's the other people's that are higher that are bad. Yeah, it's so hard when you don't have a doctor like yourself or a lifestyle medicine or plant-based doctor because they, they interpret the blood test completely differently. Yes, and I think certainly, I, you know, I've been t I've been sharing this with all the physicians I've mentored in the lifestyle medicine community to let them know about these abnormalities observed over the last 30, 40 years when people who eat so healthfully to let them know that they're not abnormal, you know. Great, thank you. Kathleen says, for the G-bombs, do you have to have everything together at once or can some things be eaten with other things within the day? For instance, I have berries and flax and chia in my oatmeal, cooked mushrooms with my morning steamed greens, raw onions in my evening salad, beans and soups. A friend has everything all at once in a salad. And do the greens have to be raw or is steamed okay? Of course they don't have to be all at once. I'm saying G-bombs are foods that we should be eating regularly, probably daily, but not all the cells have to be all the same meal, of course. But, um, and yes, we want people to eat the, the onion family and the, and the green cruciferous family, some raw each day. What I'm saying right now is that there are two raw foods and two cooked foods that maximally build the microbiome with that favorable biofilm covering the villi in the small intestines that makes for food, which makes for toxins, blocking the intake of toxins, um, antigens, proteins, but also keeping the glycemic effect of fruits and other foods you eat lower because you have this favorable biofilm made up of a thickened variety of, of bacteria. It's the huge different variety of 500 different species of bacteria that give us the healthy microbiome. And we want variety in what we eat too. The broader variety in your diet, the broader variety of bacteria, healthy bacteria you develop. So the two raw foods are to help you build this microbiome are raw leafy green vegetables, particularly raw cruciferous greens that you chew exceptionally well, and the raw of the allium family, mean, meaning onion and scallions. And the two cooked foods, of course, are mushrooms, and you should be having more than one variety of mushrooms a day when you do have mushrooms, shiitake and one other type of mushroom usually. And of course, cooked beans, well-cooked beans, especially azuki beans, black beans, and red beans in combination with the, you know, you're not, you can't have cooked greens and cooked onion, but I want some of your onion and cruciferous green consumption to be consumed raw. Now I call it that anti-cancer salad, because it includes obviously these the scallion and the onion and the, and the raw greens and we're chewing it exceptionally well with a dressing made with some nuts and seeds instead of oil because you absorb 20 to 50 times as much of the fat soluble phytochemicals and carotenoids because you did have some fat from nuts and seeds with that meal in the you know and it could be you could shoot a few walnuts with the meal but 
Um, and then the anti-cancer soup, the reason I call it an anti-cancer soup is because when we put the onion and the green vegetables in the soup, we don't, we, we puree it while it's raw. We puree first the greens in the blender, then dump that into the soup to cook. And then we puree the, the leeks and the scallion, the onion and in the blender, in its own blender and pour that into the soup to cook. It's because the enzymes, the myrosinase enzyme in green cruciferous vegetables and the allinase enzyme in the onion family still stay activated when it's broken down while it's still raw to form the beneficial organosulfide and isothiocyanates, all these beneficial anti-cancer compounds are now formed in the blender as you're break, breaking down the cells where they would normally be formed in the mouth as you chew very well. But now we can pour them in the soup and the heating of the soup will not destroy them. It's their formation that it would have impaired if we had heated them first before they were chewed or crushed. So yes, the reason why we're developing this, this anti-cancer dietary portfolio with the way to cook and prepare the foods to maximize the anti-cancer potential, and it includes a mixture of both raw food and cooked food. Sounds good. Yeah, we have a lot of questions about beans and nuts, actually, but I wanted to ask you because I recently had Doug Evans on the show, and I know you wrote the foreword to his book. Can you eat the sprouted legumes and the sprouted nuts instead of eating the nuts and the beans? Is that acceptable? Um, it could be, it could work for some people, but you, when you sprout something, you reduce this caloric density, turn it into a vegetable from a bean or a nut. So it's, so it's a good way to lose weight. Um, but some people who are athletes and bigger people need the extra calories. And obviously it's, you know, so, um, so it's, it may reduce the calories to turn your, um, it may reduce the caloric density and, and, um, and some people just need more calories. You know what I mean? But but it, but it would be acceptable in your opinion for some people that f have trouble with those foods to, to eat them that way, they'd still nutritionally be okay. Yes, except, you know, we, it's, we, we'd have to see, yes. I th yeah, if you're eating everything sprouted, what I'm saying right now is it's like eating a salad, you know, so um, if as long as they're not, they're getting enough calories and getting enough, you know, they're, everything looks good, sure. Some people need more protein and more fat as they age and their ability to biologically assimilate these nutrients go down. So if a person's getting frail, not getting good athletic response, getting muscle wasting, then you, you know, so probably you better eat the sprouts and those sprouted substances and eat a small amount of the nuts and seeds or beans would be give you more biological diversity and nutritional diversity. Whenever you narrow the diet and remove a certain amount, a certain type of food, you usually um, have a higher probability of impairing a person's health. So we really wanna have the full biologic effect of all these foods present. So in most cases, I would say it's probably better to have some, and in terms of how much they're sprouted too, you know what I mean, when, which nut you're talking about. Usually a nut that's partially sprouted is still a nut. It's not much different from a nut. Whereas a bean that's sprouted, like a mung bean, it's still, it's now it's a bean, now it's a vegetable, more like a vegetable than a bean. But most of those beans that are bigger beans have to be cooked, even if they're slightly sprouted, because they still have those agglutinins in them and they still have, would have to be cooked to deactivate the agglutinin. So, so it's very variable. We have to be more specific here, you know, as to what kind of bean we're sprouting. You know what I mean? Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Cooking this a bean, though, as you know, increases its, absorb increases its ability to digest digestibility and deactivates the, le the harmful lectins. There's beneficial effects to cooking for certain foods like beans. You know. Right. Uh, Richard Hubbard is watching live. He said to my friend, Dr. Furman, tell him I said hello. Well, who was that? Richard Hubbard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He lost a tremendous amount of weight. Oh, he's doing great. Yep. I had him on the show. He's wonderful. So... Uh, Jana writes, I'd like to know if you have a suggestion for raising blood pressure without the use of sodium. I often end up in the ER or ICU with bradycardia, dangerously low blood pressure, and syncope. The cardiologists all recommend liberal use of salt, which has worked to keep me stable. Anytime I've actively worked to decrease my sodium intake, I end up back in the ER. I do exercise every day, and I've been completely whole food plant-based and SO-free for at least four years. And other people watching live saying they have hyponatremia. So is this no salt for everyone? No, there's some people who require some more sodium in their diet because they have a certain biological genetic or acquired um, inability of the kidney to hold on to sodium. There's definitely some adjustments, but they shouldn't follow the doctor and just put a lot of salt in their diet. They have to treat this very scientifically. 
like a scientist and actually measure the amount of sodium they require so they get the perfect level. It's, it's, and it's also what's letting your sodium deviate, go high to low and medium to moderate. To, that gets, it's not good for their health. In other words, most of us, the lower the sodium, the better. The natural diet gives us about 500 milligrams to 700 milligrams a day of sodium, which is perfect because our sweat stops throwing out sodium and our urine stops putting out a lot of sodium. So we hold on to sodium well. That way we're in an athletic event going for a run or a tennis match or something very aggressively sweating. We're not gonna lose sodium and we're not gonna be playing basketball and getting cramps in our legs because we're losing electrolytes. Because when you push out and urinate out and sweat out extra sodium, you pull out potassium, magnesium and other electrolytes and other minerals with the excess sodium you're excreting. So it's better for you to be in a low sodium diet and have your body holding on to all those minerals and, and you don't need, and you don't need water, not Gatorade or something. You don't, you know, you don't need to take salt because you exercise. But there are some individuals who do not have a, their kidney is, is a impaired ability to reclaim and hold on to sodium. So they require a little more in their diet. And for those unusual people, maybe one in a hundred people, then they should experiment when it's usually reasonable to give them 250 milligrams of sodium with the extra with each meal. So that means in addition to the 750 they're getting with their diet from natural foods, they're getting an additional 250 with each meal. They're doubling the sodium, go moving from about 750 milligrams to 1500 milligrams of sodium. It's very rare a person would require, not good for them to move up to 2000 or 3000. So the doctors, so if the person did require using a lot of sodium, because the average American might be consuming 3000 milligrams of sodium, it's still considered a low sodium diet on 1500, you follow me, for, by some people's criteria. But that 1500 of a low sodium diet still has 250 milligrams of extra added sodium per meal, which is more than the average American is consuming, but this person required that. Now, if they, so that number should be titrated. So these people are using the least amount possible to maintain normalcy of their blood pressure and of their um, sodium levels in their blood. So they're non-symptomatic because excess sodium causes microvascular hemorrhages. It's a pro-inflammatory substance for the endothelial lining of blood vessels. And over years and years, it weakens the lining of the blood vessels, making them more prone to rupture, increasing a person's risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So we don't want people to consume more sodium than they require because it has its deleterious effects over time. Great, thank you. Uh, Bronwyn says, I'm wondering what your take is on collagen. I'm in the Midwest and it's extremely popular right now for healthy skin, hair, nails, and weight loss. Our plant-based dermatologist said, absolutely not. What do you think about collagen, Dr. Furman? I think most of the studies on it haven't shown any significant effects. So we have to look at whatever data we have available in the scientific studies. And I think most of the collagen that you consume orally as a supplement gets broken down into its basic amino acids and the little bit that's absorbed as collagen doesn't have the ability to go into your skin, into your joints and have, um, and have those kind of positive claims. If it did, we need some, the more radical or how she would say, the more unbelievable the claim, the more you require more substantive research and data to be able to hold that claim with some degree of authority. You know, so we need a lot of data to make that statement, to make that statement as being strong. So I don't, I don't think that data is there. Um, so it's not something I generally recommend. Well, I've never taken it. I've got healthy nail skin and was able to have weight loss. So I don't know. Why don't they just do your diet instead? Well, every person is different, you know. Uh, you know, a person could be a meat eater and say, look at me, I've got healthy nails, my weight's down. And they're one person in their, in their certain age, you know, but obviously the ultimate, um, what she could say, determinant of whether what's right is following groups of people for decades until their death and seeing how long they live and what they die of. And then we can give them better advice. You know what I mean? Yep. Let's see. Uh, Trish says, could you please ask Dr. Furman to discuss the vibrational piece of exercise equipment, the power plate he uses in his practice? I'd like to know how he uses it himself, where he gets his routine, and if he can share where one could watch and follow a class. That's a great idea because I, I was just thinking I should make a power plate plate class because it's a vibrational platform. The power plate is a little better than other vibrational technology because it moves in three dimensions, forward, back, left, and right, and up and down. It's a little more expensive, you know, usually. And it, it helps you when you exercise on it. 
it helps you get re faster results from the exercise and it makes you more tired and burns a little more calories. And a lot of the profession, almost all the professional sports teams, football players, basketball players use this kind of technology. I use it because it helps me with skiing and my, it helps with injury prevention too. So I might be doing a vibrational, um, I crossed my arms and it's a vibrational pulley, which I'm pulling up and exercising while it's vibrating, makes it harder to exercise while the pulls vibrate. And the platform is vibrating. So when I'm up there doing, like doing on one leg, I'm going down and up on one leg from side to side. And then with the other leg, I'm standing on the other leg from side to side, I'm, or I'm putting my feet together and I'm pulling against the straps, I'm lifting against the stationary motion, or I'm doing touching one toe and coming up and touching the other toe and coming up on the power plate while it's vibrating and I'm doing these exercises. It gets you more response in regard to building bone mass. And the reason I've done it, used it in my office, and I, I use this equipment in my office is because I treat people without medications who have severe osteoporosis. So I'm my style of my practice is getting people well without having to use drugs, right? So a person comes in, they're told by their doctor they need to take bisphosphonates or, or you know, some toxic drug. And I say, no, we can get you well. We're gonna give you a customized exercise program. That's not gonna compress your bones and your spine. We're gonna be gentle, but over time we'll put more force on it and we'll use vibrational technology. And we'll measure the amount of strength you have and we'll see you improve your strength and your bone mass. And I've got some great results for example, you know, have people making radical improvement in their bone mass on their DEXA scans using both of, you know, using these type of technology. So I have it at the retreat and by having it for my patients, I've been using it for myself and seeing that it, it gets my legs in better shape for sports. You know, it's just, I know the professional athletes are using it. So yeah, the power plate on, we have some, um, I've put some up of the different types of power plates on drfirman.com with an explanation of different types because they're because some are more expensive than others, some are more affordable. And so like I use the professional one because it's here at the retreat, but people can buy a home version that's much less expensive in other words. Yeah, that'd be fun to see you do uh, videos with it. I should probably do, you know, do like the top 10 exercises that I do on the power plate so people could watch them. They come with a whole slew of exercises, but I have my own that I think are better that I use for really um, building on them. And also we do, like I just did yesterday, I did, my, I did push ups on the power plate. I did, I did my leg raises for my stomach on the power plate. So my body was vibrating. It made it a lot harder. It makes the exercise more difficult, you know, to, to do doing on a vibrational platform and you just get better, at, better, um, you know, get tired out faster and get better outcomes. And they say, you don't do it more than twice a week, have enough time to recover in between the, these strong efforts. It's a lot of effort to work out on the power plate. Yeah, that, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, people are asking where your retreat is. It's in San Diego, right? Yeah, it's in northern San Diego, northern San Diego County, near the Lusardi Creek Nature Preserve. We have a thousand acres of, um, of nature walk and a hundred miles of walk, hiking trails with streams and lakes and little waterfalls. It's just such a beautiful area of part of San Diego. We can drive anywhere to the beach within 20 minutes, but we're um, but we're out in the middle of the country and, and almost like you're looking around and you hardly see any living creatures around you. It's almost, it's really an, a beautiful um, open area with great views. Dina wants to know if you miss New Jersey. Uh, not at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm living the, I'm so happy to be living to here in San Diego because it's just so beautiful here. And the, the, um, recreational opportunities. I can go to the dog beach. I could run on the beach on the sand dunes. I can go climb in the mountains. I could go surfing. I could play tennis. I could drive and go skiing. I could go, you can go to a, go to a river or go to a lake and go, you know, in other words, there's so much opportunity to have to do things that are fun and always have nice weather, you know, and always have this temperate climate where it's always beautiful and sunny and to do things outdoors and swimming, of course, you know? And so it's, um, anyway, I have, I you know, we have a small, we have a big saltwater pool and we also have a sand volleyball court. Now we don't just play vo sand volleyball. We use the sand to exercise on the sand to like move side to side motions and to have the, have the your bare feet in contact with the earth doing certain exercises on the sand. So yeah, I know what, so it's a, 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 new, um, a new part of my life, you know, where I'm not writing books anymore and I'm you know, caring for the people that are here and I have a little more free time because I'm not busy being an author and writing all the time. So I can um, slow down my workload and have more time for recreational and fitness too. Um, what took you so long to get to California? Uh, Faith wants to know how you feel about green tea, decaffeinated green tea and alcohol. Yes, yes and no. Okay, so the tea, whether it's a green tea is good, whether it's decaffeinated or not, but alcohol is no. Okay, good. 
alcohol is carcinogenic and a little bit of carcinogenic isn't so bad, but it's still carcinogenic, you know, and it's, it's still a dangerous substance. The only thing the, we have to talk about tea for a minute, the green tea is good for you. The green tea extracts are, are and the green tea are, are, have anti-cancer effects. But if you drink things that are so hot, it has pr cancer promotion effects. What I'm saying is, let the tea cool down so it's warm. If you're chronically burning your mouth with soups that are too hot or teas that are too hot, which people do, you're increasing your risk of tongue cancer and throat cancer from the chronic exposure to steaming hot substances. So the tea is good for you, but don't make the tea that hot. Let it cool off or put an ice cube in it so you're not burning yourself when you drink little tiny burns when you're drinking it. Right, but aren't there some people that just for the caffeine, it's, it's really a no? something with how they metabolize them. There's some people that just really shouldn't have caffeine in any form. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. But, you know, but, you, but obviously green tea, even the ones that have caffeinated have less, much less caffeine than coffee and their one green tea a day is not as gonna be as addictive. And, and the reason why I'm an anti-caffeine person, don't allow people or don't want people to drinking coffee and too much caffeine is because they feel withdrawal from their caffeine. They don't sleep as deeply. It enables them not to be in touch with the amount of sleep they need. It acts as a stimulant, but also it, they start to feel a little buzz when they're withdrawing from the caffeine, which is relieved by eating food. So they've lost their connectivity to feeling hunger and feeling, so they think that the caffeine withdrawal because it's taken away by eating, it makes them want to eat more and more frequently. So I, I'm really not a person, a person that discourages the caffeine consumption, but of course with green tea, one green tea with some caffeine in a small amount a day usually is not harmful. And of course we want their, um, we want to encourage people to continue their green tea. Okay. Why are you so um, adamant about people overeating, even if it's healthy food of a low caloric density, like, like vegetables or salads, you just, why do you think it's just never good to overeat? I mean, if you're in a normal body weight. Right because people are chronically, um, how you could say they're, they're not just addicted, they're, they've been chronically patterned to eat so many calories they don't need. So the average person, because of their upbringing, because of the way other Americans eat, are eating almost double the amount of calories they require through life. I always say we live on half of what we eat and on the other half lives our physicians. Did you get that? We I get on, it. Okay. <laughs> So what I'm saying right now is most people are so used to eating so many needless calories they didn't need to have that when they go to a healthy diet, they still try to connect and get eat till they're stuffed and, and they eat too much food trying to duplicate the amount of calories they were eating on their unhealthy diet. And they don't realize when you're eating this healthfully, you need less calories. You don't need that many calories unless you're getting too thin, of course. And, and to explain, and also we know that when we sleep on an empty stomach and we're, we're healing and detoxifying and repairing more in the non-digestive state, and we eat a to, to dinner to our full, when we eat too much food, it takes longer to digest it. And then you're digesting food half the night while you're sleeping in bed at night. I don't mind if they overeat at lunch a little bit, but I want them not to eat so they feel stuffed because you're, di you're decreasing your digestive capacity and your digestive efficiency when you put so much food in your stomach at one time. Um, so yeah, I've seen people overeat on healthy food and they, it's not great for their health, <clears throat> which, which let's springs into this thing about metabolism. Let's cause it, it talks about how much you eat about metabolism. Let's say for argument's sake, for simplicity, that my caloric needs for the day to maintain my lean body mass, a good amount of calories for me is about 1500 calories a day, just cause it's a nice round number. I don't know if it's 1400 or 1600, but let's just say 1500. If I consumed an extra piece of Ezekiel bagel or something, an extra 200 calories a day, let's say over that 1500. Now, what would happen to those 200 calories? Every single day, would I gain 20 pounds after a year? Because it is 3,500 calories excess per pound. So with 350 days in a year, each 100 calories over your basal metabolic rate would put on 10 pounds per year. So if I ate 200 calories extra a day, after a year, I'd be 10 pounds heavy. After a year, I'd be 20 pounds heavier, right? No, wrong. You wouldn't be 20 pounds heavier because as you overshoot your basal metabolic needs, your body compensates to try to utilize the extra calories and what it does to you without putting weight on you. So it's, your body speeds up its metabol metabolism. It, it raises its metabolic rate to burn the extra calories. So after 200 calories extra for a year, I'll only have gained 10 pounds, not 20 pounds. 
because my body will speed up its respiratory quotient, the amount of calories burned through breathing. It'll increase its thyroid function. It'll raise its body temperature. It'll set into motion a series of biological events to try to get rid of some of those calories. And in doing so, the increased metabolism as a result of the extra calories is burning your stem cells and you shorten your telomeres and increasing the biological parameters of aging. You're aging faster. So you made a deal with the devil here. I'm not gonna gain as much weight from the excess calories I'm consuming, but I'll take away some years of life at the end by, you, by aging myself faster to increase my metabolic burn and run my body temperature higher. Okay, so now here I am at 1500 calories a day. And instead I undershoot my calories by hundred calories or so each day. And I go to bed, some nights I even feel as I'm going to bed, as I finish dinner at five or six o'clock, some nights at 10 o'clock as I turn the light off, I feel, oh, I'm a little hungry right now. But I don't go to bed, I don't go up and eat. I just go to bed hungry. I just take a little sip of water and go to bed. The hunger is, when you're hunger is mild, it's not stronger. So I'm, I'm trying to err on the side of slightly under eating, not slightly over eating. I'm trying to win as a question of not having enough at dinner. Well, stop eating then if you think you're not hungry anymore. You know, you can always eat breakfast the next day. You're not going to starve. The food's right there. You'll eat an earlier breakfast then if you need to. I think people are just afraid so, to be hungry. They're afraid to be hungry. They're afraid to... Now, I undershot my calories. And I, let's say I undershot by 100 calories a day. So that means after a year, instead of weighing 150 pounds, I'm going to weigh 140 pounds, right? And the answer is no, not right. I'm not going to lose the 10 pounds because I'm already exercising a lot. So my body gets the signals from exercise that it has to... That, that its desire is to retain this muscle mass and this amount of strength. So my body wants to have, my body is getting signals from my use of my body that tells it to maintain this guy's degree of strength and muscle mass and resist losing weight because he utilizes those muscles regularly. And my body then will slow down the metabolic rate in the attempt not to lose weight with fewer calories. I always say moderate caloric restriction restriction, not excessive caloric restriction. People can moderate, can caloric restrict and become too thin. And that's not healthy for you either. You want to maintain good muscle mass and strength and size, but I can moderately caloric restrict and still maintain that muscle weight and size. The, the less you eat, the longer you're going to live, assuming you're not too thin. So what I'm saying right now is how much should you eat? You should eat as little as you possibly can, as long as you're not becoming too thin. Now, getting back to me again, who now I undershot my calories by about hundred calories a day, I'm still keeping my weight at 150 pounds though, or 146, between 146 and 150, not dropping below 146 for the year, but my body will get colder. It'll slow down the metabolism. It'll lower my thyroid function a touch. It'll reduce my body temperature. It'll slow my respiratory quotient. My body will conserve those forces of life. It'll keep that battery not being used. My, the battery in the flashlight is, the flashlight's turned off. My body's running cooler, making me age slower. So we have, the, we have the control of our metabolic rate. You can't increase your metabolism and burn hotter without gaining weight. You burn gaining weight slower, but you, it's impossible to raise your metabolism to induce weight loss. The metabolism is, is raised because of excess calories and you're still gonna be gaining weight from the excess calories, just not as fast as if your metabolism wasn't raised. So eating excess food raises your burn, your calorie burn and makes you gain weight slower, but you're not gonna lose weight. The, the most proven methodology to slow aging is to have adequate and um, micronutrient exposure with a full variety of nutrients humans need, while at the same time, making sure your body fat is low and you're not excessively consuming calories. That's the whole picture. Their people are just doing part of the picture. They don't like this part of the picture. That means they shouldn't overeat and chronically use rec recreating food between meals and constantly be eating all day long, even if they're not overweight. There are people that are not overweight that are still chronically overeating and they still could be at almost the same weight and still cut back their calories and run at that same weight and be a lot healthier if they ate less calories. Wow, thank you, Dr. Furman. There's a question from Nicole, who's a health coach. I'm gonna, it's kind of long, so I'm gonna summarize it. But what, a lot of things we talk about is, is how environment predicts your success that I always say, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And her question is basically, why do you think that so many people put up with unsupportive spouses and children? Because what, what I hear a lot is, well, I, I wanna eat this way, but I can't because you know I have to cook you know this kind of food. My husband and children won't eat this way. So what? I guess the question is, is why doesn't the family support them? But then even the bigger question is, is why does the wife put up with it? Um, well, I think that 
here's the thing. If I was a person in a household where I was eating healthfully and learning all this information, I'm excited about what I'm learning. And I think that the food I'm eating is beautiful, aesthetically beautiful, it tastes good, but I'm understanding the magical, the magic of natural foods, the magical substances it contains to do such good to the body. Now, I'm not necessarily gonna control another person, but if we have a relationship of love and respect, then those other individuals can respect me and share in my enthusiasm and even learn what I'm learning so they can support me in my endeavor. That's the starting point of is getting, so when you go from a, a house where one person learns about this information and gets excited about it, the only opportunity this person has to do to change the people around them is not to go home and say, you know, eat this way, I'm gonna divorce you or, you know, or start fights about this and try to push it on people. The place to start is two, is three, two or three things. Number one is I'd really love you to understand me and care for me and support me in what I decide is best for me. If I, if I wanted to go to medical school, this person would become a lawyer or be whatever, they pursue some, some career or hobby, they'd get support from their family or be an artist, they'd get support from their family, encouragement because they want that person to be happy and feel fulfilled in life. And this is something where we need the support of the people that live with us to make us feel respected, known and and consider it and to share in what we're learning and be feel and we want our people that love us to feel proud of us for what we're doing whether they can do it or not that's the first step then the next step is re people recognizing that this is not a, it may not be an all or nothing thing but the person in the family but, but we're this person preparing healthy food for themselves a lot of them taste good we're certainly going to these people are going to improve what they're eating it may take them some time to achieve that but then there's the feeling of love from this person who, who's, who's, who wants to change. And that feeling of love is that to the person who's not changing was, well, how would you feel if you loved a person, you loved if a person as much as I love you? I love you so much. And what I've learned is so beneficial to people that I want you to learn this and try to at least move towards it because it would be so much better for your life, your happiness, your brain function, your health. We can live in the future and have a happier life together, be more physically active. So, you know, I've dealt with this for the last 20 years when people have come to our getaways and, when, and one of the spouses is into it and the other spouse is not. But at the end of the week, when they've heard all the lectures and, and tasted all the food, I mean, the majority of those people changed over and really are doing it with their, other, or their spouse. So a lot of it just has to do with, with the relationship has to be built with a lot of care on both sides and strengthened. Use this to strengthen your relationship, to strengthen your love and care for each other and making healthy foods in the family. We want our children to eat healthy because we want them to be healthy adults, right? This, should, this shouldn't be a source of contention because there's too much knowledge, science, experience, and even knowledge and experience in making food healthy food taste great. Most people just eat the simplest diet that has no flavor and no, you know, I'm teaching people obviously to feel that it's not what they're giving up, it's what they're gaining. And that what they're gaining is more enjoyment of what they're eating. A complete, you know, more pleasure, both with taste pleasure, but also the intellectual and emotional pleasure of feeling you're doing the right thing for yourself. And that has tremendous ability to make you enjoy eating more. So I think with the right ability to teach and share with your family, you should be able to slowly get the support Support more and more of the people around you if it's done with kindness and love and with your, how should I say, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. If you're just talking and you're not doing it yourself and you can't expect the other person to change, you've got to be a perfect role model and achieve and feel better and be better and look better and be healthier for it. Then other people are going to, use, going to um, emulate you and learn and want to learn from you. So I think I'm, I'm not just blaming the person who isn't changing. I'm doing some blame here on perhaps the person that is doing the changing. Maybe they're not doing this properly in the way they're sharing, demonstrating, and, and loving the people they're living with. But sometimes it's, it's still really hard for them, especially if they're food addicts, to be living there in the house with everybody else eating crap when they're trying to eat healthy. 
they, they have to do, they have to go one, one thing at a time and, and do all these things we talked about, as well as in the process having their own refrigerator, their own storage unit, you know, maybe their refrigerator is the garage refrigerator, the one in the kitchen is not the one they touch. There's all that we've got to um, structure it. And we want the ability, the support of their people, their loved ones to help them stay on track, even if they're not doing it. Their loved ones, when I, you know, we're, for example, we want a person not to smoke cigarettes. We don't want them to be, go home and have people smoking cigarettes around them. But if they have a smoker in the house, that smoker can't smoke in the house. He, can't, he has to smoke out of the house. If this person wants to eat bacon cheeseburgers, that has to be out of the house and not in the front of the face of the person who's, who has that you know, bad, you know, bad relationship with food. But yes, all these things can be cultivated, improved, and moved in the right direction. It's never the, almost never the case that it's, it's hopeless. It's just they need the right coaching and right advice. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Well, I saved this for the end because it's controversial. But as you know, just like with all of our guests, especially when they're doctors, people want to know how you feel about the COVID vaccine and if you personally are going to take it. Well, keep in mind that I just want to say that I'm a, I spend untold amount of hours researching the scientific literature on nutrition and health and longevity. And I even have scientists that work for me, Dr. Ferrari, PhD, as you know, those are on my staff who, who I'm, who's always researching and reviewing articles. So, so we are stay up to date on re nutritional research. I'm, I'm not an immunologist. I don't stay, I'm saying that because I don't stay up to date and knowledgeable about all things regard to vaccines. It's not my field of specialty and, and the toxicity of vaccines and the possible side effects of vaccines and whether they work or not, and whether this vaccine is going to do some more variants and make it worse for people in the future. It's gonna, so these are unknown, um, I should say, uh, unknown known guesses people have. Some people saying, well, these vaccines are going to, in the throes of the pandemic, are going to make for more variant changes in the virus and make more people die and have third and fourth and fifth waves that are even worse. And some people are saying, well, the, the RNA vaccines are going to be bad for people's health long term. So the answer to the question is, I don't know. I really can't answer that question. Um, my gut feeling, not based on science, just based on feeling, is that I, if, that they may most likely the case that the variants are going to continue, and in a year or two from now, people are going to need more vaccines. And so, to, I'd rather take less vaccines right now, and maybe if I was going to take a vaccine, take the J and J vaccine. It's just one vaccine rather than take two RNA, which is a newer technology vaccine, because it may be the case that you know a year from now or two years from now, you need an extra vaccine if there's new if a new variant of COVID starts to um, kill so many people again. So the answer to the question is that I'm not professing to be an expert in this field, um, and I have, and I probably, when the when the vaccines become available for healthy people, um, right now I think it's 65 and older. Um, I am 67, of course. Um, I probably could get the vaccine shortly. It's just been made available in California for people 65 and older, and I probably will get the J and J vaccine. Just because I want to, just because I'm thinking that I'm not worried about COVID myself. I've never been even miss, missed a day of work in 50 years. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't even get sick from anything. But, um, but not, but I, I just want to have give people more confidence around me and people that I care for that I'm not going to be putting them at risk. So I think I probably will get. Um, I haven't got get the. I'm thinking the J and J vaccine. It's more standard technology. And it's one shot. You know, and it, and also it doesn't require so much care in 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 freezing it. Or um, so if something does something wrong in the preparation or storage of it, it's not likely to go bad or something. They're probably going to get, uh, probably would get that shot. But but certainly I'm respecting people with different opinions and different because nobody knows and it's a lot of there's a lot of unknown here. Yeah, Sorry question. about the people working in the. That's okay. Um, well, I'm going to let you go because I know you have to be somewhere. But just one last question. You're, I know you're going to live a long time with your healthy lifestyle. But what do you most want to be remembered for? Well, you know, it's, the, it's what I enjoy doing the most. And that is, um, I've impacted so many individuals and given them a better life. And they know I've cared for them with a lot of kindness and love and knowledge. And I've gotten pe a lot of people to transform their health. And I have, so I have so many thousands of people that appreciate my work and what I've done for them over the years. And I mean, if I, um, and I don't need to do accomplish anything more in my, I'm not, uh, you know, I still wanna, I still get pleasure from doing what I do. Um, but I'm not um, under some pressure to um, do anything. I feel satisfied with the amount of people I've touched and what I've accomplished in life. And I think that I'm proud, I'm proud of that. And I think that people who have changed their diet and gotten and, and learned about health and nutrition, and they've also gotten themselves in better health like you, who then reach out and help other people, they get that same feeling of superpowers of doing good for humanity and being kind to people. So I think it's the, it's the people I've touched and known that they know I care about them 
and do everything in my power to help them get better. Thank you, because it's incredible how many people, even yesterday on the show that I interviewed, that their point of entry was either one of your PBS specials or your bookie to live. Mm. Well, thank you. And, my, and to, to put a plug for my latest book, I'm obviously Eat for Life because I want people to have the more modern, updated research. And because they still think of me as reading Eat to Live, which is great, which is they should read it. But of course, it's better when people read more things that are updated, have more updated research and more scientific support as the research has accumulated over the last decade, making this way of eating overwhelmingly supported by the scientific literature. Well, thank you so much for the work you do. And we'll see if we can keep you in the number one spot and you can come back anytime. Sounds great. Thanks, Good luck, Dr. everybody. Nice talking Take to you. Care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow where my guests are Dr. Doug Lyle and Dr. Alan Goldhammer.